joining us from your homes and classrooms across the state or even perhaps the country. My name is Lauren and I'll be your conductor today and I would like to welcome you to our virtual horse to horse power program here at the California State Railroad Museum. We are located in our state's capital of Sacramento and are one of 280 California state parks and together we work to protect and share our state's most valuable natural and cultural resources. Now I'd like everyone watching to think of an innovation that you think has had the most impact on your life. All right, have you got one? Maybe you thought of something that brings you entertainment, safety, or comfort. In 1869, there was an achievement that forever changed life in America. That was the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad that for the first time linked the east and west coast of our nation. Our museum commemorates this achievement and the people who made it possible. Over the next 30 minutes, you will hear from five of our park staff about how the Transcontinental Railroad was planned, built, and its lasting impact on our country. Now, as you follow along, I invite you to think about the challenges the people in this time faced. How did individuals' innovation and determination help to overcome these challenges? And what might your life have been like if you were alive during this time? Now, let's head on inside into the museum and journey back to the year 1854 to this very spot in Sacramento to learn about a determined and bold thinking man named Theodore Judah. Let's head on in. Have you ever had a dream? Or have you ever wanted to do something so badly no one was going to stop you from doing so? Well, that's how Theodore Judah felt about building the Transcontinental Railroad. He was going to build it, and no one was going to stop him from doing so. But why was building the Transcontinental Railroad important? Well, for one thing, California had just had a gold rush, and people from all over were trying to make their way to California to find their fortune. But at the time, there were only about three ways to get to California. The first way was to walk or ride a horse across the entire country. This could take anywhere from six to eight months and was very dangerous. Many people did not survive the trip west. Another way you could get to California was by boarding a boat in New York, sailing down around the bottom of South America and back up to California. This way of traveling also took about six months. The final way you could get to California was by boarding a boat in New York, sailing down to Panama, walking through Panama, through the jungle, boarding another boat, and sailing back up to California. This way only took about three months, but many people did not survive this trip, as people often caught diseases such as malaria and yellow fever in the crossing of Panama. This allowed for Judah's dream to exist because a transcontinental railroad would allow people to cross the country in days rather than months. From the time Judah was a little kid, he loved railroads. In fact, by the time he was just 14 years old, he was helping to run a railroad in New York. When he was around 28, he got a job offer in California to help build a railroad from Sacramento to Folsom. He quickly accepted this job offer, and he and his wife Anna moved out to California. And although this job didn't last long, he saw it as his opportunity to start building the Transcontinental Railroad. Once in California, Judah started to do a survey of his desired route through the Sierra Nevada mountains. He would often take his wife Anna with him on these surveying trips. She would help keep him organized and even help sketch the surveyed land. Eventually, after about a year of surveying, Judah found a route through the mountains at a place called Dutch Flat. Armed with this knowledge, Judah went back to the East Coast to Washington, D.C. to try and convince Congress of the need to build the Transcontinental Railroad. Unfortunately, he was unsuccessful in this attempt as there were many different opinions on where the route should be. Once he returned to California, Judah looked for investors elsewhere. He first went to San Francisco, but was again turned away as their interest often lied in shipping rather than trains. He eventually found four investors in California. Their names were Leland Stanford, Charles Crocker, Collis Huntington, and Mark Hopkins, 
who would later be known as the Big Four or the Associates. They helped Judah fund the final bit of his survey as well as make a map of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Armed with the map and knowledge of the route, Anna and Judah went back to Washington, D.C. once again to try and convince Congress again of the need of the Transcontinental Railroad. This time, they were successful, and in July of 1862, Abraham Lincoln signed it into law. Lincoln saw the Transcontinental Railroad as a way to unify the nation during the Civil War. Judah went back to California, and on January 1st, 1863, they started building the Transcontinental Railroad right here in Sacramento. Eventually, Judah and the Big Four had some disagreements and the pair split up. Judah, not wanting to give up on his dream, headed back to the East Coast to try and find new investors to help build the Transcontinental Railroad, but unfortunately, on his crossing of Panama, caught yellow fever and died shortly later in New York. Although Judah never got to see his dream completed, the Transcontinental Railroad changed the history of not only California, but the country forever. There's no doubt that Theodore Judah's determination to find a route through the Sierra Nevada mountains got the Central Pacific Railroad off to a promising start. To make his dream come true, he took it upon himself to do the physically challenging and time-consuming work of hiking through the mountains and surveying. He also got the right people on his team and didn't give up when his first pitch for funding was rejected. It is a shame that Theodore Judah didn't live to see his dream become a reality, but his story lives on here at the museum. Now that there was funding and a plan, that left the greater challenge of building the thing. Next, we will move on to learn about the people who helped the Central Pacific Railroad blast their way through the Sierra Nevada mountains. Building a railroad is tough, hard work, and the Central Pacific had the difficult task of building a railroad up and over the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Chinese immigrants made up 90% of the workforce. They graded roads, bored tunnel through solid rock, laid track and built bridges. They had to cut down trees and clear dense brush. They cut away land in some places and filled it in in other places. And they did it all by hand because there were no steam shovels, power drills, or tunneling machines. Instead, they used picks and shovels, wheelbarrows, carts, and horses. The men worked 10 hours per day, six days per week. Work in the Sierra was the toughest of all because of how brutal the Sierra winters were. The winter of 1866-1867 brought more than 40 snowstorms, 40. The snow was so deep, the men working up there built snow tunnels to get around in, but they kept working. The railroad ran 24-hour shifts with Chinese workers chipping and blasting away at the solid granite rock. The railroad hired more than 10,000 Chinese men to do this work. Have you ever tried to break a rock? If you have, you know it's a really difficult thing to do. Well, imagine chipping away at a mountain built of rock and building a tunnel big enough for a train to get through. From 1865 to 1867, Chinese railroad workers built 15 tunnels. The most difficult was tunnel number six, or summit tunnel. This tunnel was 1,695 feet long. That's almost five football fields lined up end to end. The Chinese worked day and night. Using a star drill, something similar to this, one man would hold it in place while another pounded it with a big, heavy hammer. And when he hit it with the hammer, the other man would turn it a quarter turn. Hammer, turn, hammer, turn, hammer, turn. All day, 
until they made a hole that was about two and a half feet deep. When they had several of these holes, they put in black blasting powder and then they packed it with straw and mud and lit a fuse. Boom! It blasted away the rock and the workers would carry away the rocks in baskets and wheelbarrows. Day after day after day after day they did this. Now what do you think it would be like to work in a tunnel like that? It'd be cold, it would be dark, and very loud as you blasted deeper and deeper into the mountain. Your supervisor would be yelling at you to work harder, and the air would be so dusty and confined that it would be very hard to breathe. It was very difficult work. Many of the men died in blasting accidents or in avalanches in the mountains, but the Chinese continued to work hard. And they finished the tunnels in the summer of 1868. By the way, the snow was so bad, the Central Pacific built 37 miles of snow sheds, like the one that we have here in the museum. Some people called that the longest barn in the world. Well, for all this work, the railroad paid Chinese workers less than white workers. By June of 1867, Chinese earned about $35 a month, which equals out to about $600 in today's dollars. White workers made more, plus the railroad paid for their food and lodging. Chinese workers wanted $40 a month and to work eight hours a day instead of 10. When the railroad refused, 5,000 workers went on strike. It was the largest strike of its time. This was very bad timing for the Central Pacific because they had a very strict time schedule to meet. Time was money, and the more tracks they built, the more money they made. Still, they refused to pay the Chinese what they asked for, and they cut off their food supply. After a week without food, the Chinese went back to work without the raise in pay that they had demanded. But they made their point. They stood up for themselves, and it was a sign of their collective strength. The Chinese proved to be very hardworking and dependable. They had to deal with extreme prejudice from other white workers and from supervisors. But they eventually earned the respect of Stanford, Huntington, Crocker, and Hopkins, the big four, who could not have built the railroad without them. While the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad is a historic accomplishment, it wasn't the money-making success story for everyone. As you heard, the Chinese worked harder and more dangerous jobs, earned less money, and faced constant discrimination. During his governor's inaugural address in 1862, Leland Stanford called the Chinese an inferior race and called on using the powers of the Constitution to limit immigration. As we will discuss, this racist policy came to be a reality decades later. With the completion of the railroad, Stanford changed his views of the Chinese after he saw their importance to its success. The struggle of immigrants and laborers in America is not an issue of the past. We still have a lot of work to do as a nation today. Speaking of today, let's take a look at where China is with their own railroad system. China now has over 15,000 miles of high-speed rail track, which is the largest network of high-speed rail track in the world. This network makes up two-thirds of the world's total track, and it can run trains of up to 200 miles per hour. Hard work and innovation has put the Chinese at the front of railroad achievement then and now. As we move forward to commemorate the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, we cannot forget that the project would not have been successful without the work of immigrants on both the Central and the Union Pacific sides. Now let's skip on ahead to May 10, 1869. I hear we're just in time for a celebration. The date is May 10th. 1869. The place is Promontory Summit, Utah. The occasion is the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. The attendees include Leland Stanford of Central Pacific, Thomas Durant of Union Pacific, some other railroad officials, and about a thousand track workers. All these people have come together at this location on this day to celebrate the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. 
This was the culmination of a 20-year American dream, linking California to the eastern states with 1,776 miles of track. The ceremony was supposed to take place two days earlier, on May 8th, but two important people were delayed. Central Pacific's Leland Stanford was being carried by a locomotive called the Antelope, but a crash with a fallen tree damaged the Antelope, and Stanford had to wait for a locomotive called the Jupiter to complete his journey. Union Pacific's Thomas Durant was delayed by angry track workers who had not been paid. The workers prevented Durant from departing for promontory until they got their money. So the ceremony was delayed until May 10th. For this very, very special occasion, four very special railroad spikes were created. Nevada contributed a spike made of silver. Arizona donated an iron spike plated with silver and gold. A San Francisco newspaper gave an iron spike that was beautifully engraved and gold-plated. And Sacramento businessman David Hughes provided a solid gold spike. Most of the nation's telegraph wires were networked together so that as the final golden spike was tapped into place, the message could be received all across the nation. This allowed people everywhere to celebrate at the same time as the people who were attending the ceremony. As the last spike was driven, a cry went up, three cheers for the United States of America. Huzzah, huzzah, huzzah. With the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, it became possible for travelers to reach California from the eastern states not in four or five or six months of difficult and dangerous travel, but in seven days and seven nights. Does this sound like an improvement to you? Of course it does. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attendance and your attention.